Okay, so first is the real easy question, just say and spell your name for me. Uh, Nate Becker, N-A-T-E-B-E-C-K-E-R. What was your view of the death penalty before you were a juror? Uh, before I was in panel as a juror, I was uh, in favor of the death penalty. Uh, I grew up in, in central Minnesota and uh, kind of, you know, central U.S. there, and, uh, where it's fairly prevalent and grew up believing that, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of a deal. And, so it was in support of the death penalty. So you get your, walk us through the process of which case you were on and how that kind of all played out. Uh, well, in 2014, I was uh, summoned for uh, jury duty for the Edward Montour case in uh, Douglas County. Um, and went through about a week of uh, showing up and doing different uh, voir dire and different questioning. Uh, and then eventually was impaneled as one of the uh, 12 finalists and uh, sat through jury trial for a couple of day, couple of days before uh, before it ended. What? How did that change your opinion and why? Well, you know, right away my opinion, you know, I was fairly neutral. I was willing to go either way. I wasn't strongly for or against, but, but felt like I definitely could, um, you know, put somebody to death if I felt it was the right circumstance or situation. But um, once we sat through openings and closing and witnesses and heard uh, the information and that was coming back and forth, uh, for me, it was really a life-changing event experience. Um, really realize that uh, you're not hearing the full story. Uh, when you sit through a jury trial, they're only presenting the evidence that they want you to hear that's going to support what, what each side wants you to do. Um, and when you're asking somebody to determine whether or not another uh, life should be taken, uh, I just didn't feel it was fair or appropriate uh, that we were picking and choosing information, uh, that we were trying to hide information and hide facts uh, from the jury because, you know, at the end of it, we were very clearly and plainly told that once we, once the judge allowed you to hear all this information, we knew you would never convict him to death. So we had to give him a deal. And so for me, that was, uh, that was amazing. And I was astounded that, so once we heard the full truth and the full information, we knew we wouldn't kill somebody. Why were we here in the first place? Why were we seeking the death penalty? And, and so for me, that was the experience I really made me opposed to the death penalty and, and why it should be abolished. So why, why I'm kind of, in, is that normal that it, for a judge to do that? You know, whether it's normal for a judge, I have no idea. I mean, obviously the district, deputy district attorney didn't feel it was and felt the judge's rulings were inappropriate and that the, they allowed the defense to provide us too much information or information that they didn't want us to hear. Um, you know, whether that was right or wrong, I, I have no idea, but I know that um, you know, the DA was very upset that the jury was allowed to hear that information because they knew if we heard it, we would feel sympathy. And if we felt sympathy, we wouldn't kill somebody. And, and to me, as a, as a person, to, to have somebody basically tell you, well, if you hear everything and you feel bad for somebody, you probably won't kill them, so I don't want you to hear that information. I mean, it was so narrowly focused on, we just want you to kill this individual, and we only want to present you the information that will help you come to that conclusion. We don't want you to hear everything. And so, you know, whether that's common or not, I don't know, but, you know, uh, in our circumstance, it was very concerning. I'm going to wait for the lovely siren to pass. Without fail, every time we do one out here, it's a busy road. All right, go. Um, It's a pretty heavy thing to be asked to do regardless. I mean, can you talk about that? Was it hard to be in those shoes? It was, but ultimately we didn't have to make the decision. So the, the point where we sat in a, in a room and had to decide guilt, and then if we decided he was guilty, determining the appropriate penalty. Fortunately for, for us as jurors, we never had to go through that. And so I'm not sure that that reality ever really set into any of us, because we never got to the point in that particular case where we had to make that decision. Um, you know, it was something that all of us were aware of that at some point we believed we were going to have to make. Um, I'm just not sure that any of us were mentally prepared to make that, you know, at the point in which that trial ended. So what ended up happening? I'm not as familiar with this case as far as, did you find him guilty or no, what was actually, the... actually in our situation, um, we went through a couple of days of trial of witnesses and uh, I think it's the second or third day of trial, uh, the uh, elected DA, George Rockler, gave, uh, pulled the death penalty off the table and gave a plea bargain offer of, of uh, 
life. And so we showed up thinking we were going to continue the trial and we're told, no, we've reached an agreement and they're going to take a plea and basically trial is over. Um, and so we never had to get to the point where we had to make a decision. If you were going to summarize your view on the death penalty now, what is what is your stance and why? Well, absolutely opposed to the death penalty. Uh, I just believe that our, our justice system is valid. It's, it's not perfect. Um, and if we're going to be in the business of, of, of taking people's lives, of, of executing people, uh, we have to get it right 100% of the time. And we're not. Um, you know, there's a human element. There's a lot of different reasons why our justice system isn't perfect. But um, I just can't live with the fact or sleep with the fact that we could potentially convict somebody and kill somebody who may not have committed the crime, who may not have deserved that outcome. Um, and so until we get it 100% of the right, I don't believe we should be uh, taking people's lives. And, and we're nowhere close to 100%. And uh, I think statistics and numbers have shown the number of people who have been convicted, who have been sentenced to death, who later came back and were exonerated and shown that they were guilty. I mean, how many of those people have we had throughout the country um, that we ended up, I don't want to say fixing, but catching the air and exonerating them? Well, how many people have we killed that we never caught the air? And, and that's the problem that I have, is why I don't think uh, our government, our court should be at the business of, uh, of, of executing people. <coughs> You kind of talked about your view before, an eye for an eye. Has that view changed in that the idea that, you know, we hear from those who are against the death penalty that, you know, why should we stoop to the level of those right. who are doing the crime that is so heinous? Right. I mean, I mean, the, the theory of an eye for an eye, I mean, is the reality is we're, we're going we're gonna to kill people to teach people that killing is wrong. I mean, it's, there's something fundamentally wrong with that mentality and, and that premise. Um, you know, the eye for an eye, I do believe there's, there should be punishment. I do believe the punishment should be adequate. I just don't think that execution is the, is the appropriate punishment, uh, regardless of the crime. Um, the reality is, is that execution and death is final. We can't come back. Um, and if we make a mistake, uh, that to me is the worst mistake we can ever make. And regardless of how confident we are of somebody's guilt, Again, every time we sentence somebody, there's confidence and guilt, and there's hundreds and thousands of, of verdicts overturned every single year in this country that show that we got it wrong. Um, and there are a lot of people that sit in prison that, that never get exonerated who, who didn't commit the crime. And so to take a chance to kill somebody is where I have the problem. And so um, I do believe in punishment. I do believe people should uh, take responsibility and there should be uh, consequences for their actions. I just don't think death is the appropriate act. Did you think the process, I know you didn't go all the way through, but was that it worked as far as jury selection, I imagine, was much more intensive for this case than others? Right. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, whether it worked, it depends who you ask, right? If you ask the district attorney's office, they'll probably tell you no. If you ask the defense, they'll probably tell you, yeah, it worked. Um, you know, I felt like the, a lot of the people that were in uh, the panel as a juror with me were, were reasonable, they were open, they were willing to listen to um, all the evidence and, and make a decision. Again, we never had to get to that point, so I'm not sure if that was true or not. But, um, I mean, I think it, it worked. Uh, obviously, it worked to the point where uh, the district attorney realized that, you know, 12 or 18 people sitting in a box who get to hear the full facts and full disclosure are not going to kill this man, so we can't take a risk in proceeding with the trial. So in that perspective, I think it worked perfectly. And so what was that process as far as there was evidence that the, the DA was trying not to be heard, that the judge ruled they would? In this particular case, the evidence that the defense was presenting was evidence regarding why uh, Edward Montour was in prison in the first place. And he was originally uh, convicted of killing his infant child. Um, and the defense presents a lot of information to show that he very well may not have killed his infant child. And he very well may not have uh, have been imprisoned uh, wrongfully, um, kind of walked through that evidence and what would happen if you had uh, significant mental health issues, if you were wrongfully accused in the prison of killing your infant child, uh, what life is like in prison as a baby killer. Um, you know, it's really, there's child molesters and there's baby killers at the bottom of the totem pole, and kind of walk through what life would be and, and what could happen to somebody in that situation that would, could cause them to do uh, something as egregious as, as what happened in that case when he killed the uh, prison guard. Um, 
Mr. Otterby, uh, Eric Otterby, and, uh, and they kind of presented that information, and that was information the district attorney did not want to stay here because they knew that we would feel sympathy for somebody who possibly was wrongfully imprisoned. Um, and so that's kind of was the turning point of that case. What, did they ask you your stance on the death penalty as you were a part of this? What was that, those it's questioning? When, when you go in for these, and it was my first experience as a juror, um, you know, the first part was we had to appear and we had to fill out a, a fairly lengthy um, you know, written questionnaire regarding our position on a lot of different things. You know, obviously our stance and what we, our beliefs in the death penalty were part of that. Um, and then, you know, as we went through and they narrowed, narrowed the pool down, then we went in for um, individual, you know, interviews, what, uh, what I heard, where they asked us specific questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the court. And then uh, once they, they narrowed that down even further, then they brought us in as a group of, uh, I don't remember, 50, 75 people to try to get it down to the, to the final 12 or 18 in this case for the alternates. We all kind of know when it comes to, to jury selection, if you don't really want to be on the jury, there's a way to not be on the jury. Right. Why did you feel it was your duty to, to be open and, and potentially be willing to, to decide such a serious case like this? Well, I don't think anybody wanted to be part of that jury. I know I didn't. Uh, I just feel that there's certain things that, that are responsibility and we have a civic uh, duty and responsibility to uh, do things such as serve on jury. It's not convenient. Um, it, it costs a lot of us time and money, and, and, and there's a lot of things in life that we would all prefer to be doing. I just think we have a responsibility. And I look at that saying if it was me or a loved one or somebody I cared about, uh, regardless of what crime we were being accused of, I would want them to have a fair and impartial jury. I would want to have not necessarily people that want to be there, because I think there's a concern for me if you want to be there, um, but I want somebody who's willing and understands the big picture and understands uh, the role that they, that a jury plays in the judicial process. Um, and so that's why I was open um, to, if they picked me, they picked me. If they didn't, you know, oh, no problem. I'm a, I don't want to be on there in the first place. Um, you know, we were projected to be on there for three to six months, and they made that clear that that was going to be a three to six month commitment every day, five days a week um, for, you know, our foreseeable future. And those of us who, um, took that seriously, we're going to, I don't want to say embrace that, but accept it. Um, if we didn't want to be on there, it's like you said, it's very easy to come in and take uh, a polarizing stance on one side or the other to kind of show yourself as being not an ideal juror. Um, and I think obviously both sides were looking for people uh, somewhat in the middle that were open to arguments and could be persuaded to go one way or the other. Um, and so I think it did a good job of, of finding a pool that would do that. How did you walk away feeling about the death penalty? Because I kind of get the sense from you were for the death penalty or saw that it may be an option, Sari, or will serve justice in, in a certain case. Um, but how, do you, how did you walk away feeling? Oh, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's exactly how I felt going into it. And I walk, uh, walked away angry. I walked away disappointed in our judicial system. Uh, I walked away embarrassed on how we prosecute cases and how we um, seek convictions and not justice and I felt like the death penalty is not justice it's vengeance um, and and vengeance doesn't belong in our courts and it doesn't belong in our judicial system uh, we, if we seek justice we seek what's right we disclose all the facts and all the information and we allow uh, people to come to the correct conclusion um, and it became very apparent to me that we're asking people to come to these conclusions and we're not providing them all the information. We're hiding facts, we're hiding information and asking them to do that. And, and so that upset me and it frustrates me that, you know, something as final as that uh, could be looked at uh, so arbitrarily by, by the prosecution to, you know, kill at all costs mentality. So I'm hearing, you know, it was that you, you did hear that evidence, but the fact that the prosecution didn't want you to hear that evidence to you says how can you make a decision without knowing that evidence. Right, and, and I'm not saying what decision we would have come to. I have no idea what decision we would have come to. We didn't hear all the evidence, obviously. Uh, the trial ended, you know, after a couple of days when it was projected to go months. So there was a ton more evidence that we were going to hear that could have swayed our decisions one way or the other. But once the trial ended and, and the deputy district attorney told us that once the judge allowed you to hear this evidence, we knew there was no way you were going to kill him. 
that was that was just, it was shocking and, and eye opening to go. So you mean to tell me once we heard everything, you knew no reasonable rational person could kill him, but yet you still pursued the death penalty, and it was your goal the entire time to try to hide that information from us so that we would kill this individual. Um, you know that that's shameful uh, in my opinion. Oh my gosh, is that me or you? Oh, it's me. I th um, I think I'm. Sorry. Yeah. Of course, it's my phone. Uh, okay. I was gonna try to get a two shot, but yeah. Uh, tag. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Was there anything else that you wanted to add that I didn't mention? No. Um, you know, I just I think the one thing, and, and luckily for me that I never had to go through, but after my experience, there were a lot of people who had served on. As jurors on death penalty cases throughout the country, who reached out to me, and some of which who had to make that final decision. And, and the one thing that I don't think um, people consider in this process is what that burden does to people, jurors. You know, that decision that they make that they have to live with for the rest of their life, and how that impacts them and impacts their family. Not only while they're going through the process, but if, if at the end of the day they make that decision one way or the other, they have to live with that. And that's a burden that um, I'm not sure we should put on uh, the average citizen. Um, and another reason that I, I, I think we should consider abolishing the death penalty is, is that um, is that fair? Is it fair to ask another person to live with that for the rest of their life? Do you have an opinion on the Watts case? I mean, that's why we're kind of doing this story. Um... My, you know, my opinion is that if he is um, guilty of what he's being of doing that um, it's heinous, it's, it's horrendous, it's, and, uh, and I think he should be punished accordingly. Uh, I just, again, um, don't feel that death is anything other than vengeance and retribution, and it's not justice, and um, I would personally would rather see somebody spend every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every year rotting in prison um, being, uh, to me, that's much worse penalty than, than death. Death is, 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 is an out on that aspect of, of that. And, and uh, you know, I think the appropriate penalty would be uh, in prison. Jacob, did you have anything else? No. Okay, do you need to get a couple shots? Okay, he's just going to get a shot. It's kind of the two of us talking. Doing it. And living with that decision. And regardless if you put the individual to death or not, you're always living with the decision. Did I make the right choice? Did I do the right thing? Um, you know, the, the scrutiny that these people are going to face. The, um, you know, again, when you're, when you're when that, you kind of have to separate yourself from your family and your friends and your loved ones while you're in the process of being a juror. But after, at the end of it, you know, everybody's going to have an opinion and, and they're going to come at you one way or the other with what you did right and wrong, and they're not going to know all the information, they're not going to know the facts, and they're going to have to live with that decision, not only with yourself, but in, in the public opinion, with friends and family, and uh, ultimately don't really know what you went through, and you can understand that, and, and I'm not sure that that is, is fair to most people.